Hey guys, it's Mr. Lowry. Hope you're comfy at home, sitting on the couch, or maybe in your bed learning about math today. Um, right now it's like 8 p.m. and I'm still here at school making videos for you. So hopefully this is helpful for you. Um, but I'm also going a little crazy. So we'll see how this goes. Um, okay. I want to talk about a couple definitions. We're actually going to do some proofs today. Now we're going to take it kind of easy. We're going to do some algebraic proofs, which is essentially going to be solving an equation with some justifications. I'll show you what that looks like. It shouldn't be too scary. It's also something we did last semester. So if you were in my class last semester, then you've seen this before. But I kind of wanted to give like a formal definition for what a proof actually is and what we're going to be you know, building over the next few days and weeks. Okay, so a proof is a logical argument that uses a chain of reasoning, uh, and usually it's deductive reasoning, to show that a statement is, is true. Now, I said deductive here, but you can do different kinds of proofs. There's such a thing as an inductive proof. When we talk about deductive and inductive reasoning, that will make a little bit more sense. But for now, most of the, the reasoning we're going to be doing is, is deductive reasoning. Use it, definitions and, and uh, postulates and theorems and things. Which kind of brings me to my next definition, or my next um, key point here about proof is that every step of a proof needs to be justified. You need to be able to say, I can do this because, I can say this because, this is true because. So you're making like this argument or this chain of arguments, linking these chain of arguments together, but each step is solid. You're saying, I can say this because of this theorem, I can say this because of this axiom, I can say this because of this definition. So every step of a proof needs to be justified with an established, which means already agreed upon um, or proven definition or postulate or theorem or property. So remember in Euclid's elements, Euclid comes right out at the beginning and says, okay, before I can even do anything, let's take a couple definitions and get them out of the way. There's like 23 definitions. And then he lays some common notions out and he lays some postulates out. And basically he's stating these are the things that I'm going to be using later to argue, to make arguments, to justify my arguments. Okay, so we're going to grab a couple um, properties here. Now we've done a lot of definitions, we've done a few postulates, we're collecting a list of things that we can use to start reasoning, and we still have a little bit more to go to do some geometric proofs. But right now we're going to talk about some properties of equality that you maybe already know or, or that are pretty obvious, but that we need to know what they're called so that when we start using a chain of deductive logic that we can justify each step by saying I can do this because of this property. Okay, So let's take a look at what we have here. So here's the, some properties of equality. There's an addition slash subtraction property of equality. Now sometimes these are called different things like you'll say the addition property of equality and sometimes it'll be the subtraction property of equality. But they're essentially the same thing. And the idea here is that I'm allowed to add and subtract the same number from both sides of an equal sign. Okay, so this is kind of how we use this. If I had something like this, 3x plus 5 equals 20, if we were going to solve this equation, the first thing we want to do is subtract 5 from both sides. Okay? Now what that's using when we do that is the subtraction property of equality. The idea that if I have two things that are even, right, equal means like even or balanced or they're the same, and I subtract the same number from both of them, then I should end up with two things that are still equal. Right? So Euclid would probably call that a common notion. We're going to actually call this a property of, of real numbers here, that we can actually do this. And we would end up with 6x equals 15. Right? We would be using the subtraction property of equality in that case. Now, similarly, we could add you know, the same number to both sides, and that would also work. We could add 5 to both sides, and we'd add 10 to both sides. That's not going to really get us much farther in this equation solving, but we can still do that. So there's an addition property of equality as well. Okay, then there's multiplication and division, which is a similar idea. Let's continue our equation here. The next step that I would do in solving this equation would be to divide by 3. x equals 5. Right, but how can we do that? Like, how can we actually say that those are equal? The idea is, if you have two things that are already equal, and you divide them by the same number, the results should be equal to each other as well. 
Again, kind of a common notion, uh, Euclid would call it, but Euclid didn't deal as much with numbers and algebra as he did with shapes and geometry. So this isn't something that he would have used in the algebra sense. He would have just called this a common notion. Right? Subtract two things from two equals, and you're going to get two equals still. Okay, the substitution property we use all the time. Um, there's lots of different ways that you see it, but this is one of the ways you've seen it in the past. If I had something like this, y equals 3x plus 20, and then y equals 5x minus 10, basically what I have is two things that are equaling y, right? This quantity equals y, and this quantity equals y. So the idea is, if I have two things that are both equal to y, then they also must both be equal to each other. And so what I can do is I can say 3x plus 20 is equal to 5x minus 10. Right? We can do that. We can basically replace this y with this guy, or make these two statements equal to each other, because we know they're both equal to y. Again, Euclid's saying that's a common notion. He says things that are equal to something are equal to each other. That's one of his common notions. So that's the substitution property. We can replace anything with something that it's equal to, and whatever statement we have will still be true. Okay, let's talk transitive property. This is very, very similar to substitution, only there's a specific order to it. Okay, this is what the transitive property is. Um, basically, the, the, if it symbolically looks like this. If A is equal to B, and B is equal to C, then what must be true is that A is equal to C. Right? If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, well, you could say that this is substitution because you're like, well, hey, they're both equal to B. So that means A has to be equal to C. And that's true. It's kind of a substitution. The difference between transitive is that it's a specific order. The first thing is equal to the second thing, and then the second thing is equal to the third thing. So there's this like chain, and you basically, you know, connect up these two statements end to end, and then you skip over the middle. Okay? There's a law of logic that we're going to talk about that looks similar to this. It's called um, the law of syllogism, which is a very similar, but it uses statements instead of like numbers and algebra. Another way to say this is, let's say x is equal to 5, and then 5 is equal to y. All right, notice the first the, the beginning of the second statement ends, excuse me, the beginning of the second statement is the end of the first statement. So there's like an order to it, whereas you don't have to have that with substitution. In this case, I could say, well, then x is equal to y. Right, something like that. Okay, That's the transitive property. Again, it's similar to substitution, but there's a specific order to it. We're going to see this guy in a couple different places. Come up. We're going to talk about the transitive property of congruence. Right now we're talking about the transitive property of equality. We're going to talk about the transitive property of congruence probably tomorrow or later this week. Um, but also, again, we see this in just logical arguments called the law of syllogism, which we're going to come back to. Okay, the reflexive property. So reflexive property, again, is, is a pretty common notion, but if you're, um, if you're in geometry, sometimes stating something is uh, congruent or equal to itself is going to be important. The reflexive property, think about like a mirror, right? Reflexive is like reflective, and it has to do with something being equal to itself. So the reflexive property is every number is equal to itself. So like 3 is equal to 3, for example. So um, that's pretty obvious, but when we're talking about geometry stuff, reflexive property is a little less obvious. But we'll talk about that kind of when we get into proving angle relationships and segment relationships, which will probably be later this week. So anything is equal to itself. That's the reflexive property of equality. Um, the symmetric property, symmetric has to do with um, being the same either way. So the symmetric so property of equality, um, you can flip a statement, an equality statement, and it'll still be true. For example, if I get something like this, as an answer, 3 equals x, I can write that as x equals 3. And that statement's also true. So you're allowed to rearrange you know, the, what's on the sides of the equal sign um, and still get a true statement. Right? If we got this, we'd be like, OK, cool, the answer is x equals 3. We wouldn't really think twice about that, but that's the symmetric property of equality. So again, these are all properties of equality. 
addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, substitution, transitive, which is very similar to substitution, reflexive, and symmetric. These guys are going to come back again. We're going to see these later. Later, we're going to compare and contrast properties of equality, which we have here, with properties of congruence. And there's actually a transitive, reflexive, and symmetric property of congruence, but we don't get the stuff on this side. We'll talk about that more when we get a little bit more deeper into congruence. Today we're talking about you know, algebra proofs um, and like numbers and things like that to get started with proof. And we're going to kind of veer back into geometry, which is a little bit trickier, but this is kind of our, our starting point. Um, we have a few more properties to talk about. There's some properties of addition and some properties of multiplication that we need to talk about. And then after that, we're going to get into our, our algebraic proof, which is, again, basically we're going to solve a, an algebra problem for x or something like that for a variable, but we're going to use these statements as justifications along the way.